Chuck says, uh, says uh, 530. I'm just, I'm just wondering if I can get away with this sort of chalk. What do you think? I think so. Do it. Take that risk. <laughs> what? Take the risk. Okay. All right. Well, you remember that we had uh, the action for for the Nambugato string of length signal one. Well, it's not really length signal one, but parameter signal one is x dot dot x prime squared minus x dot squared x prime squared. And then this is d sigma d tall. OK. Now, of course, x dot is, um, or x mu dot is partial x mu, partial tall and x uh, mu prime is partial x mu partial sigma. So the sigma is the parameter. We have a string here, and um, sigma is the length, um, the length parameter along the string. So we go like that, and this is sigma is a particular point on the string, and we integrate over the string. The, um, if you want to pursue this further, there's a book called String Theory, uh, a first course in String Theory by Barton, Barton Spiebach. I think it's available on bookcz.org, um, although I don't guarantee it. But um, if it is, Whenever you see something on bookcz.org that you want, download it immediately because um, you never know when the copyright owner will ask that the link be deleted. Okay, so this is the. So, by the way, does this show up on the in the video? You think? All right. Um. Now, uh, x dot dot x prime is, of course, x dot mu, eta mu nu, x uh, prime nu, and eta mu nu is, um, I guess, minus 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and so forth, diagonal, okay? It's... The point is that mu and nu go aren't just zero to three; they could be zero to twenty, zero to twenty-five, or zero to. In fact, for 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 bosonic strings, in other words, unless you add fermions, you need uh, twenty-six total dimensions. And of course, as I one must keep in mind that string theory is a very speculative subject. It has given rise to some very good mathematics, but it may have nothing to do with elementary particle physics or the universe or anything else, living or dead. Um, on the other hand, it, it yeah, as I said, it has developed, it has led to um, important um, mathematics. Now, um, the thing about the string that um, is somewhat fascinating is that you can chain, you can go from sigma tau to any other parametrization, uh, sigma prime, tau prime, and the action is invariant. So that's that's the kind of thing like, that's a, that's reminiscent of the possibility in GR to change your coordinates in an arbitrary way, and the, the actions uh, still invariant. And the echo in the standard model is that you have local symmetry under gauge trends, under rotations of the fields into each other, and the rotations, the gauge transformation can be different at each point in space, time. 
All right. One thing to uh, this, this little c, I, I should have written a little bigger, that's the speed of light. And um, let's see, what was I going to say? I'm going to say something that I've forgotten. Yeah, one can take advantage of the uh, flexibility in the parameterization to choose a parameterization for a um, for a particular calculation. And um, one that is nice is that um, x dot d tor b, b d t and um, that uh, x prime d sigma be some dr pointing in some spatial direction. And then what happens is that, in, in fact, for simplicity, let me let me go e make things even simpler. Let's just say that x zero is c t is c tor. This is called the static gauge. And um, so then, if you have and and moreover, let's say that x j that uh, x j dot is zero for j greater than zero. In other words, spatial indices. Oh, wait a minute, do I want to say that? No, I don't think I want to say that. Okay, anyway, x dot is proportional to dt, this is proportional to dr, and so one arranges that x dot dot x prime should vanish. And so that term is zero, and then one arranges that uh, typically x dot squared is negative. And um, in this very simplest parameterization, what you can have is that s is then minus the string tension over c, this double integral of just dt dr. And this is then minus t0 over c, tf minus ti times r1, in other words, the, the, the coordinate, the, what r vector is at sigma 1. And so this, the idea then is that this is area swept out because it's time, the, the time amount times R1, and so this is area swept out. So that's the basic, basic picture. Now let's look at the, um, let's derive the field equations. What we have is the change in x dot, so uh, the, Action density depends upon x dot and x prime. The change in x dot mu is um, the change, of course, in partial x mu, partial tor. And so this is um, the partial with respect to tor of x mu plus dx mu minus partial x mu, partial tor. And so this is just the tor derivative of the change in x mu. Similarly, uh, the variation of x prime mu is the sigma derivative of the variation of x mu. Okay, so this is, this is that standard razzmatazz that happens when everyone does the principle of least action. So now the change in the action is an integral ti to t, tor i to tor f, integral zero to sigma one of, I'm gonna, I, I skipped a line in the equation in, in my notes and um, 
Now I see that I'm paying for it because I forgot to say what L is. So S is an integral of L uh, d, uh, d sigma d tor. So L is this square root thing. All right, I'll do it over here. L is minus t0 over c square root of x dot dot x prime squared minus x dot squared x prime squared. So that's L. So this change in the action is partial L, partial x dot mu, partial variation of x mu, partial tor, plus partial L, partial x mu prime, uh, partial of the variation of x mu with respect to sigma, it's all that d tor d sigma. Okay, well, you can um, imagine that we've got, uh, these are actually sort of complicated, partial L, partial X dot mu, partial L, partial X mu prime. They are what are called the momenta, and one can write them this way, P tor mu, which is partial L, partial x mu dot is minus string tension over c x dot dot x prime times x mu prime minus x prime squared x uh, dot mu all over this, the same square root, I'm just going to write it as square root, and p sigma mu partial L, partial X mu prime, this one minus T0 over C, and now it's uh, X dot dot X prime, X mu dot minus X dot squared X mu prime, and then again over this square root, the same square root, this is the square root. Okay, so this change in the action is double integral of uh, if we integrate by parts, and so let me let me do that in a sense explicitly. Variation x mu p tor mu plus partial partial sigma variation x mu p tor p sigma mu minus variation x mu times partial p tor mu partial tor plus partial p sigma mu partial sigma d tor d sigma. Okay, so, and this is just an identity. I haven't really integrated my parts and dropped the surface term because if you differentiate uh, with respect to the, the, d, the variation of x, you then get this term and differentiate the variation of x again, you get that term. If you differentiate instead the momenta you get variation of x mu times this thing, and so this cancels. So let's see. That's the way it works. Okay. Well, there are, these terms are quite different. Um, this one we can integrate and throw away because it gives us boundary terms at the final and initial time, and we just say the variation of x mu by definition of sigma and tor, tor star is zero. Star meaning t final or t initial. The way we do the variation, in other words, is we say we want the action to be stationary with respect to variations during the process, not variations at the end point. And so this term goes away. Then we have that term and these terms. So our equations of motion then are 
first of all, this one, this thing is arbitrary, so this has to vanish. And then this has to vanish. So the equation of motion then is partial P tau mu partial tau plus partial P sigma mu partial sigma. The sum of those two is zero. So that's the wave equation, basically. On the other hand, we need also that an integral of the variation of x mu at tau sigma 1 times p sigma mu tau sigma 1 minus the variation of x mu tau 0 p sigma mu tau 0 d tau, this has to vanish. So um, what, I, what I've done there is you just do the sigma integral, and so you get this at, the, at sigma 1 minus its value at, at 0, and we want this to vanish. OK. Now, if the string is closed, so a closed string, so a closed string has, um, well, it has that the variation of x mu tau sigma 1 is variation of x mu tau sigma 0 because, tau 0, say because 0 and sigma 1 refer to the same point in space-time. And the same thing is true of the p's. p sigma mu tau sigma 1 is p sigma mu tau 0. So s closed strings are um, kind of no trouble at all. They automatically satisfy this condition. But um, open strings are different. And um, for open strings, what we need is variation of x mu tau sigma star, star meaning 0 or sigma 1, times p mu sigma tau sigma star should vanish, and this is no sum over mu, no mu sum. Mu sum sounds like Chinese food. <laughs> okay, so um, this has to vanish at each end and um, uh, for each mu. Now this, so you might say, God, this is awkward and silly and crazy. Um, and, and yet there's a certain, there's something cute about it. And the cute thing, I think, I think it was Polchinski who noticed what was cute about this, or at least gave it a nice interpretation. Um, and so let's, let's first of all consider mu greater than zero, spatial index, we have two choices. We can say p sigma mu of tau sigma star is zero. So that means that the momentum density at the end of the string should vanish at all times. Or that the change in x mu of tau and sigma star should vanish at the end points. But now, x mu, when x is, when mu is zero, this is essentially, a t this is by convention a time variable um, in any parametrization. And so we can't say that uh, this doesn't change. So we can only say this for the spatial indices, g greater than zero. Okay. Now this is really quite cute because what this is telling us is that if we have an open string, 
we can either go, we can either choose that, and in fact we must choose this when mu equals zero for an open string. So for an open string, so for sure p zero sigma four sigma star vanishes. That's for sure for an open string. But for the spatial, but the um, for the spatial coordinates, so let me. What, what we have is if j is j greater than zero. Let me put that. I'm using j for spatial indices. So we can either have the momentum vanishing or that the variation of x j doesn't change. And on the other hand, for the time component, we can only have that. Now, the amusing thing about this is what this means is that we can't vary the spatial locations of the ends of the spring, a string. And of course, what, what you can say then is that you've got some sort of a surface here and the string does something like that. These points are fixed and it's only the string here that can move. Okay. And this thing is called a brain. Is, and is the string bound in the brain or can it leave the dimension of the brain? So well, the endpoints are fixed in the brain. Yes. But can the string Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Um and uh so this is normally called a D-brain in honor of Dirichlet, but since Dirichlet didn't have anything to do with strings, and since Polchinski pointed out that this might have something to do with strings attached to surfaces, and this surface can be of arbitrary dimension. Um, uh, uh, some people would like to call this a P-brain. On the other hand, that sounds kind of funny, and so most people, instead of calling the P-brain, call it a D-brain. So, I don't know, you take your choice. Uh, one thing that, um, uh, I, I think I mentioned to you earlier, is that the action density L is a homogeneous function, in other words, L, of alpha x dot, alpha x prime, is alpha L of x dot x prime. Hmm. So it's a homogeneous function of degree one in the time and space derivatives. And, um, Consequently, by Euler's theorem, the uh, energy of the string, or at least, I mean, what, what one chooses to call energy in string theory, I'm not quite sure, but the standard definition would be this, and um, it turns out that this vanishes because of this relation. And in fact, um, so as I said to you, um, I may have said to you, Andal and I derived this in, with our fingers painstakingly, so I sent email to Witten, he wrote back and gave me this nice Euler argument, um, which is, uh, much nicer than um, what we had. So the total energy of the string is always zero? I don't know how to interpret it physically. I mean, I, I, I haven't worked in string theory. Yeah, well, I guess I'm just going to confuse the line. Is that know like what total is. energy or just? Well, that's, you know, if you have a field theory, this is the thing that's conserved because of the equations of motion. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a puzzling business. All right, let's, let's now um, look at a, uh, a rotating string. So we're going to imagine that 
only two of the space components are non-zero, and the time component, in other words, x0 is once again c tor is ct, and um, x1 and 2, sigma tor are going to look like this, sigma 1 over pi, cosine pi sigma over sigma 1, parenthesis cosine pi ct over sigma 1, sine pi ct over sigma 1. So these are the coordinates 1 and 2, and why don't we say xj is 0 for j greater than 2. Let's just make it simple. Then if you compute well, among other things, x dot dot x prime vanishes. And if you compute p vector tor t sigma, or tor sigma, which is then t0 over c partial x, I am, I'm getting these constant phone calls. Um, I get two or three from a robot that works for Marriott. I get them all the time. Are you so, too? Yeah, I get them all the time. I get like four a day. Yeah. And, um, and then I also get Viagra ads. Um, <laughs> and so all together, um, I'm much in demand. Phone ringing all day long, <laughs> but it's really outrageous. Um, I really think what we all should do is call our representative. What's her name? Uh, man, she's a Democrat, and just call up and say, "I'm sick of these fucking robot calls. Do something." And um, you know, she gets. I would say if everybody in this room calls, you act. Or we can build a, we can build a call bot that just spans phone calls to, to show you what's this. Let's make that plan B for the moment. Um, okay, if you compute the tall momentum, uh, the one and two tall momenta, you get T0 over C, cosine pi sigma over sigma one, minus sine pi CT over sigma one, cosine pi CT over sigma one. So you get that. And then the angular momentum M12 is an integral 0 to sigma 1 of x1 p tor 2 tor, well, leave out the tor sigma, everything's tor sigma minus x2 p tor 1 d sigma And if you now substitute our formulas for x1 and p tor, what you find is that this is, is sigma 1 t0 over pi c integral 0 to sigma 1 cosine squared pi sigma over sigma 1 d sigma and this turns out to be sigma 1 squared t0 over 2 pi c. So the integral of cosine squared, of course, is a half, um, a half sigma 1. Um, OK, now, uh, in this parameter, well, I, I still want to choose one more thing about this parameterization. I want to say that. Um, d sigma is proportional to d e, so sigma 1 is proportional to e, and e is t0 of sigma 1. Now how this, uh, whether there's a conflict between e being 0 and e being that, 
I'm, I just don't know what to say there. Okay. Um, I guess they're two different E's. Okay, so this thing is J. So we have this relation here. And in fact, if we say that sigma 1 is E over T0, then this turns out to be J is equal to E squared over 2 pi C T0. Now this is a very interesting relation. And um, the remarkable thing is that many baryon, many hadrons obey this relation with um, T0 approximately 0 0.92 GeV per Fermi. So that's the string tension. And um, if you look at the notes, the curve is J over H bar. Uh, six zero say and energy one up to two point eight GeV and the curve basically that's one the curve basically does something like that. That's the curve and the points are essentially These are, this is the nucleon N938, this is neutron proton. This one here is the delta 1232, it's a pion proton resonance. And then this is a, let's see, do I, this is N1680. Uh, this one is delta 1950. This one is N2220. And this is delta 2420. OK, so the so remarkable thing is that this kind of works. Yeah. So I think I missed when you said what J was. Is that just the angular momentum, or? J is angular momentum. And so the, the remarkable thing is that The, the hadrons and um, many of the hadrons fall along curves like this. Um, some don't, though. There are some n's and deltas that don't fall on the curve. And so this, in other words, this, now, the, the way I think most people today would interpret this is to say that that when you have well, I don't I don't quite know what to say because I don't think of the 938 as doing this but if you can imagine these guys up here where they are spinning like crazy um, you can imagine that there's a that uh, there's a, these are three quarks uh, and a gazillion gluons held together and um, as they spin faster and faster uh, spinning at relativistic speeds that um, this thing stretches out into essentially a line and in fact it may be that the that the, uh, the proton, it after all, has spin one half. And in order to, to, to um, spin, uh, in order to have spin one half, it's probably turning pretty quickly. So I don't know. I don't know quite what to say about it. I'm just showing you what some of the evidence is. But here's something truly magical. Let E and J be the energy and angular momentum of, 
now for something totally different, a curved black hole. <laughs> What's the relation? The relation is that j is equal to e squared over c to the fifth divided by a g. Now I have to say what a is right? when I was when I was writing this up. I didn't notice that there was an a there that I hadn't defined. Um, Ah, yes, all right. I, I will define it in a minute. A is less than unity. And if we rewrite this, we can rewrite it in the form, of course, E squared over 2 pi CT. So what is T? Well, T is then C to the fourth over 2 pi A G. Well, whenever you have the coupling, con the Newton's constant, the denominator, being uh, the smallest constant one has ever heard of, and C, the fastest speed in the numerator to the fourth power, no less, and A, less than unity, um, what we have is something that is roughly 37 orders of magnitude Well, let me write it as an equation. So T, are we calling it T or T0? I don't know. All right, I'll call it T, T curved black hole is roughly 10 to the 37. In fact, it's 10 to the 37 times T0. So you thought this one was big, namely almost one jeb per Fermi, a Fermi being 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, 10 to the minus 15 meters. Uh, this one is 10 to the 37 times greater. Okay, so the, now whether we're to interpret something as enormous as a black hole see anything analogous between a black hole and a tiny string, I don't know. But um, it's nonetheless interesting that both things have uh, seem to obey the same relation. Okay. Now, just a little history. String theory um, became a subject of considerable interest in 1968, um, when uh, Gabriel Veneziano published an amplitude for pi pi scattering, and um, it was an amplitude in terms of three Euler beta functions. So this was, um, from the point of view, I guess you want to turn that around. Right? From the point of view of mathematics, it was um, quite a startling result. And what happened, though, after about eight years of intense work, is that people at Slack discovered quarks. And so this picture of string theory as explaining quarks um, kind of, kind of, it, it was abandoned, basically. Um, on the other hand, in 74, Joel Schuch, a French physicist who died very young at the age of 33, um, and John H. Schwartz proposed increasing the string tension by 38 orders of magnitude, one more than that one, than what I wrote down there, and imagining strings to, uh, that strings were the basic things in the quantum theory of gravity. And that's been the attitude since then. And the graviton, in particular, is a closed string, so the graviton doesn't have to stay on the brains. Okay. All right. So um, I hesitate to invite questions because you know my understanding of string theory is 
paper thin. Um, but ah, I have a question. question. I'll, I'll be the devil's advocate. Um, do you so? Do you have any idea of what it means that a graviton doesn't have to stay on the brain? Well, the graviton doesn't stay. Yeah, on yeah. The what, what, what does that mean for the graviton? Oh well, because it's a oh, if you interpret it as a closed string, okay. Then these these boundary conditions here. What, can you follow? These boundary conditions are automatically satisfied with closed strings. Yes. So you don't need any of these. Yeah. No, I get that. It, like, I get why it doesn't stay on the brain. What does that mean for the graviton as opposed to like another particle? Do you have All right. Um. I actually used to know, but um, I think so. As I said, I've been very tired this afternoon. There was also a seminar that went on forever. Um, uh, so let me think. The idea somehow is that all right. Let me let me throw it out to you and. Um, Imagine that it's pet spaghetti and tell me if it sticks to the wall or not. Right? Um, the idea is that if the graviton is a closed string and doesn't attach to the brain, then it's in these large numbers of dimensions. On the other hand, we're stuck on the brain because we're made of quarks and leptons and uh, gluons and photons and so forth. So the gravitational field then, you'd think, would fall off as 1 over r to the 10th or something. Um, sort of Gauss's law in that many dimensions. And so consequently, um, yeah, if you have, in other words, if you have, well, here, I might as well try to use, let's see if there's anything that works here. So let's suppose we have this brain here, and we have, there's a string, and uh, then we have another string over here. So that one's you, and this one's me, say. Then uh, the communication is via these uh, these closed strings, and so you could radiate a closed string, but you're going into you know say ten dimensions, and so the gravitational force between us is um, m1 over r to the Tenth, eighth, whatever. Let's say eighth. So it's m1, m2 over r to the eighth, and um, so what we say is that this is equal to g m1, m2 over r squared, and so this is some coupling constant c, say. Um, so we might say that G is, um, this is R squared, obviously. So G is C over R to the sixth. I don't know. Um, does, can we imagine that this is small? I'm not sure. I think the I think there's an argument. I think people have made an argument like this to say that C is of order one, order point one or something, and G is small because of this R to the six. So on the other hand, this whole picture Alright. I as I said, I don't I I I haven't worked out that detail. Well, it's more than a detail, but that's a sort of the. It's a. It's how some people think that big G is as small as it is, um, but um, I don't know. I, it, 
that little that r to the six looks looks like one over zero to the six. That doesn't strike me as small. Yeah. So in other words, it's like gra this is a possible explanation of why gravity is so weak because it's kind of leaking into the other dimensions that we are yeah yeah yeah. Seeing. That's the idea. Maybe what we can say is that um, no, I I don't know. I. In the literature, you I mean, if you just Google the thing, there's probably a wiki page that will explain this more sensibly than I just have. Sorry about that. Um, all right, let me go on with what um, I actually did um, more or less prepare. But what is true is that the gravitons are interpreted as closed strings and they're not on the on the, on the uh, string. So. Dirac, of course, did a gazillion things. Um, one of his things was light cone coordinates. And um, I included a section on them just because I think it's nice for you to hear about them. So his coordinates are x plus, x minus, x2, x3. So in other words, you pick one of the space coordinates, you call it x1, and then you mix time and x1 into x plus and x minus. The normal way of doing that is to say that x plus is 1 over root 2, x0 plus x1, and x minus is 1 over root 2, x0 minus x1. So this is sort of the standard convention. I've now realized that I haven't um, erased the board, and so let me do that so that it can dry. Um, Is there not an issue with imagining particles being strings which are bound on some brain? Isn't there one? If it's 3D brain, then you could say that that's three space. That's fine. Right. So I, I, I don't understand. What are you saying? Can, can these endpoints move around on the brains? Is this an issue for particles moving around in space? Well, this equation here, what did it say? It said that um, you can't move the endpoints. Yeah. So it looks to me as though they're just stuck. So they're, but, so they're fixed. Okay. I don't think but I, I mean, I, 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 I take your point because after all, you could say, well, um, if we're if we're saying that ordinary matter are strings that are stuck on the brain, well, if the brain is three space, ordinary particles certainly move in three space. Yeah. That's the issue. So I don't know. I'm I. The the vibrational state of the right. springs, but you're right, if it's moving. If, if, if the string should be moving, describe the space, yeah. It, it wouldn't even evolve in time then, right? No, it should just be breaking. It should just be static. Hmm. Let's see, I mean, what I'm sort of thinking, is well, the string is closed, and so it has to be fixed, right? Well, it's really the difference, you know. Um, so maybe what you could say is that. These two guys have to be the same. And so then they could move synchronously. I don't know. But then point is fixed relative to. But then you need the P's to be 
equal. So that'd be another way of doing it, but that's not what most people do. All right, anyway, let me go on with what I think might be more or less true, and that at least is, um, as I said, I have not studied this stuff. In, I haven't worked in the field. I have studied it a little bit. I haven't worked in the field. Okay, um, what is P plus? Well, Dirac's P plus is the same thing. It's P plus or minus 1 over root 2, P0 plus or minus P1. And so then the specially invariant uh, ds squared, so Dirac was thinking of special relativity when he introduced uh, light cone coordinates. And this is then dx dot dx minus, of course, dt squared. And so this is d2, d, dx2 squared plus dx3 squared. And the rest of it is minus dx minus dx plus minus dx plus dx minus. So it's a, now of course you could just write this as two times one of them. Yeah. Why are these called light cone coordinates? Is this describing like a null surface? I guess. Um, I'm just trying to figure out what x plus and x minus like are technically top of. Well, suppose you had x minus equal to zero. Yeah. That would be on a light cone because x0 and x1 would have to equal each other. Yeah, okay. So when one of them yeah. is. But, okay, so now we have this variance p dot x is then uh, p2 x2 plus p3 x3. And I'm just, well, now you do want to use this notation because now it's minus p minus x plus minus p plus x minus. And in ordinary quantum mechanics, we have um, i h bar d d x zero of e to the i p dot x minus e t over h bar is equal to e over c same phase factor, e to the i, I'm just going to write it as px over h bar. In light tone coordinates, it's i h bar d by dx plus of e to the i, and I'm going to write it as just px, but what I mean is this thing. And that is p minus e to the i px. So d by dx plus is p minus two i's give you a minus sign, and the minus sign cancels that minus sign. Okay. All right. So, so in other words, p minus is the same thing as e over c. So this is basically these are light cone coordinates, and I think it's it's good that I showed them to you, not that you're going to use them tomorrow, but you may hear about them at some point. Yeah. So what do these light cone coordinates describe physically? Because I've honestly never they heard try, it's just It's just different, a different way of using x0, x1, x2, x3. Because I've honestly never heard of light cone coordinates. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you have. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we can do. All right, now, in, um, as I mentioned to you, you can choose a gauge in string theory. And um, if n is a unit vector, then one gauge or class of gauges is n dot x equals beta Alpha prime is just the string tension, or one over the string tension, I don't remember, it's one or the other. N dot P, tor, 
and n dot p is equal to 2 pi over beta n dot p tor. Okay. So th this is a choice of gauge. n is a unit vector. What's beta? Beta is 2 for open, 1 for closed uh, strings. All right. So this is chapter 9 of Spivak. Um, but what's the reason why I'm going through this is that these this choice of gauge does get you something. Namely, we get certain constraints, and the constraints are x dot plus or minus x prime squared is zero. And the momentum densities then are p sigma mu is minus 1 over 2 pi alpha prime, alpha prime being just a constant related to the string tension, x mu prime and p tor mu is 1 over 2 pi alpha prime x dot mu. So these are hugely simple compared to the other expressions that I've erased. And you then get a wave equation. x mu double dot minus x mu double prime equals zero. So this is pretty simple. Now we've got sigma less than pi greater than zero. And the string tension, t0 t is 1 over 2 pi alpha prime. So as I said, alpha prime is the inverse string tension. In the sense. So in as much as in this gauge we have this wave equation, it turns out that the x mu's has a simple form, x mu 0 plus square root of 2 alpha prime alpha zero mu times tor plus i root two alpha prime sum n not equal to zero, the zero one is already done, e to the minus i n tor over n alpha n mu cosine that's a mu, okay. Cosine n sigma. This n has nothing to do with the other n. This n is an integer. Okay, so we have this because of this wave equation. Notice constant satisfies the wave equation. Linear and torus satisfies the wave equation. And then these guys, which are just trigonometric functions, satisfy the wave equation. Okay. Oh, I'm um, sorry. These ones are the open ones. Uh, closed ones, uh, it's basically the same except for this last term, which is so ditto plus ditto plus i square root of alpha prime over 2, sum n not equal to 0, e to the minus i n tor over n but now alpha n mu e to the i n sigma plus alpha n bar mu e to the minus i n sigma. Okay, so these guys are closed and so they have to be periodic. It's not obvious to me that if you let sigma be uh, zero and then sigma equal to sigma one, that the two are identically equal, but I guess one way or another they are. All right. So this is a, if you look at the condition on the back with the unit vector n, whole big class of gauges. One of those gauges is the light cone gauge, which is x plus is x0, well, let's just say 
or x plus is x plus plus x1 over root 2, and we set that equal to beta alpha prime p plus tau, and p plus, which is p0 plus p1 over root 2, is equal to 2 pi over beta p tau plus. And here we have x plus prime is 0, x plus dot is beta alpha prime p plus. Okay, now in this gauge the action is very simple and it's equal to 1 over 4 pi alpha prime integral d tau, integral d sigma, 0 pi, and it's just x dot j, x dot j minus x prime j. Well, I could have written it as squared, so I'm going to write that as squared. This could have been written as squared. Um, and the coefficients of these open strings are x0 plus is xn plus is 0 for uh, n not equal to 0. Um, and there's one more, square root of 2 pi alpha prime, alpha minus n is 1 over, uh, all of this is on the web page, okay, so you don't need to copy it down. Sum on p minus infinity, infinity, alpha j, n minus p, alpha j, p, and this is by definition L perp sub n over 2p plus, and this thing here is said to be the transverse Virasoro operator, or the Virasoro mode. So now, the, the, the nice thing about this is that the string is expressed entirely in terms of, trans, of, of transverse modes, and the mass squared of the string is 1 over alpha prime, the sum, alpha ln, that's the value squared, n equals 1 to infinity. Okay. All right. So, I've finished with the whiteboard. Blackboard is dry. Anyway, this is really intended to be the flavor of it rather than to go through the details because the details are um, a lot of details. Okay, let's now quantize this system. Since it, it has such a simple quadratic structure, one can quantize it. So we're in either we're in the light cone gauge, and we have x uh, j say of tor sigma commutator p tor j of uh, tor, or actually p tor j prime say of uh, tor sigma prime, and this is i eta j j prime delta sigma minus sigma prime. So it's the standard commutation relation h bar equal to 1. On the other hand, uh, x0 minus or tor p plus tor, that commutator is minus r. And on the other hand, the xj's commute and um, as do the pj's. At equal times. So four into the four time. So then if you take, if you impose these commutation relations on this, on these expansions of the field, 
of the strain, I should say, um, you can achieve them by setting alpha i. Okay. All right, let me just do it with j. Alpha j m, alpha j prime n is then m, curiously enough, eta j j prime uh, delta n plus n zero. So these coefficients in the, in the expansion have these funny commutation relations and also x zero j p j prime commutator is i a to j j prime. All right. Now it turns out if you want Lorentz invariance, you need twenty six dimensions. So is that a minimum or an exact number? I think it's exactly 26. And the reason is, well, let me see. All right. Um, not only do you need 26 dimensions, but also there's a tachyon. So, um, I don't know, this is a nightmare city as far as I'm concerned. But here's the, uh, here's what, all right, let me, let me just say that if you do go to 26 dimensions, what's the Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian is L0 plus minus 1. Now, it's quantum field theory in two space dimensions, two space-time dimensions sigma and tall. So there are divergences and how does the how do the string people interpret it? Well the divergence is of the form sum n equals one to infinity of n. That looks pretty bad. <laughs> and how divergent is that? Well that's quadratically divergent. And um, you go to three dimensions, it's cubically divergent. Four dimensions, ordinary quantum field theory, quartically divergent. So this is the divergence of a field theory in two dimensions. The string people say, well, we're going to interpret this as, um, there's a mathematician called Sir, who, um, uh, gave a series expansion for Riemann's zeta function. And this thing is zeta of minus one. If you now use Sir's expression for this, what you get is minus a half sum on n zero to infinity, one over n plus one, and then the sum k equals zero to n minus one to the k, k plus one squared n k. And God, did I write that same equation twice? Well, that's the biggest typo I have ever seen. This is. That's the trouble with LaTeX. You hit, you click on typeset, it's gorgeous, and you think you've got something that makes sense. <laughs> anyway, if you actually do this sum, <coughs> what you find is minus one twelfth. And on the other hand, this sum here appears in this equation. One equals minus a half d minus two times the sum on n from one to infinity. Well, obviously, you could do from zero to infinity. It wouldn't hurt very much. 
of uh, n. And now if we're saying that this sum is minus 1 12th, then we get the equation 1 equals minus a half t minus 2 times minus 1 12th. And so that's the statement that d minus 2 over 24 is equal to 1, so d is 26. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think much of this. Um, it may be that, that there's more here that's legitimate than meets the eye. I mean, certainly what Sir did was correct, but um, it's, I don't know. All right, it may be okay. Um, let's see, we've got four minutes left. Uh, super strings. Well, what one does for super strings is one takes that original action. Again, we're still in light cone gauge. One over four pi alpha prime. Integral d tor, integral d sigma, x dot j, x, well, x dot j squared, I'm not going to. Oh, write it as x dot j, x dot j, that is ridiculous. Minus x j prime squared. Then you add to that, and in fact, I could add it right in there because it has the same overall coefficient. You add in psi 1 j d tall plus d sigma. Notice it's light cone. Psi 1 j plus psi 2 j d tall minus d sigma psi 2 j. Okay. So this is the action in which you've added fermions in two dimensions, two components. And now the advantage is you have no tachyon. And uh, 26 drops all the way to 10. So you have 10 dimensions. Uh, some nine space dimensions, one time dimension, 10 dimensions. Turns out there are five distinct superstring theories. They, their, their names suggest supernovas. Um, type 1, type 2a, <laughs> 2b, and then E8 cross E8 heterotic and SO32 heterotic. Yes. They all, all five, may be related to a single theory in 11 dimensions called M theory. And M theory contains membranes, two brains and five brains that are not D brains. All right. Um, by the way, I mentioned uh, Shirk and Schwartz. Um, uh, Schwartz uh, is coming uh, and giving a colloquium next fall, 20th of October, if I remember correctly. Um, so as I said, he's one of the founders of uh, what's called new string theory in the sense of um, using the very uh, String theory is a theory of gravity. Now, Polyakov, the Russian theorist, um, suggested a, um, well, there are, two different, there are two different actions. Let me show you a covariant action. There's a covariant action, which is 1 over 4 pi alpha prime integral to tau d sigma, and this is um, x mu dot x mu dot uh, minus uh, x mu prime x uh, lower mu prime. So that's a covariant action, manifest Lorentz invariant, invariance, and the momentum operator is a simple p mu 
is just x cubed dot over 2 pi. Okay, so that's simpler, but what's, what's more interesting is the polyacorp action, although there are commutation relations. All right, look, we're out of time. Let's just say I'll pick up here next time, and um, I'll maybe talk for 10 or 15 minutes, and then you guys will um, give some presentations. Um, so I guess that's, I guess we'll do that. And uh, there's no final exam, and I think we'll just forget about doing anything in final week because you've got, some of you may have exams, and so there's no point in it. All right, why don't we turn it off? Unless there's another.